Coming up at New Day at Arirang, South Korea again expects around 2,000 new COVID-19 infections Tuesday. The figure could even rise further amid sprouting cluster infections ahead of this Tunung College entrance exam set for Thursday. U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping are said to have their first ever virtual meeting in the coming hours. The agenda will likely include the thorny issues of Taiwan, the South China Sea, human rights and trade. And Seoul's first vice foreign minister, Choi jong gun has made clear that the South Korean government seeks to create a denuclearization process from which no one can easily walk away. Hello and welcome to this Tuesday edition of New Day at Arirang. I'm Mark Broom. It's 8 a.m. Korea time on November 16th here in Seoul, South Korea. And I'm Kim Mulgan. As usual, we have a packed show for you for over the next hour. We'll be taking a look at the big news stories of the day and get expert insights on the issues facing Korea and the world. Now, we begin with the COVID-19 situation in South Korea, where the nation is likely to see another daily COVID-19 tally over the 2000 mark. But more concerning, perhaps, is the increase in critical cases, which is close to the overburdening of the health care system in the capital area. Health authorities are drawing up a plan to try and address the problem. They certainly are. For more on this, all COVID-19 related news, we have our reporter Kim Yon sung in the studio uh, with us. Good morning, yon -sun. Good morning. So let's start with the numbers then. How's it looking on this Tuesday? Well, Tuesday may be another day with another COVID-19 daily over 2,000. Health authorities logged more than 1,800 new infections up to 9 p.m. Monday night. So the official tally for this morning may be somewhere closer to 2,000. Included in Monday's tally were cluster outbreaks at two high schools in Jeju-do Island that ended up infecting at least 31 students and staff. This is sparking concerns in that area because the National College entrance exam is just two days away and they obviously don't want any situation that puts the test taking students at risk. Other than that, over 80% of the cases reported were from this whole metropolitan area, which is also concerning because the region is also seeing a very high concentration of critical cases as well. Health authorities on Monday said that three out of four ICU beds in this whole area are filled and with more than 400 critical cases emerging daily nationwide, with most of them concentrated in this whole and Incheon area, the capital's healthcare system is quickly filling up to reach maximum capacity. So Yeonsun, what are South Korean health authorities doing to address this problem? Well, for one, they did say earlier that they were going to pull some emergency breaks on the Living with COVID-19 plan if they found the healthcare system was becoming overwhelmed. Fortunately, they say that the country is not at that point yet, and they are still capable of handling the current situation by acquiring more beds and redirecting the patients to healthcare units with more room. Meanwhile, though, they are going to announce a contingency plan with specific specific details on what kind of steps they are going to take in terms of prevention measures when the current situation escalates to a full-on health crisis. They're calling the plan a circuit breaker. The plan was actually supposed to be announced today, but the announcement has been postponed to this Thursday. This is actually the second time the announcement has been pushed back, so it seems like health authorities need more time to fine-tune the details and get the local governments on board. Now, what do you mean when you say health authorities could put the emergency brakes on the living with COVID scheme? That kind of insinuates that there's a possibility it could be scrapped or at least partially rolled back. Right. Well, one of the criteria that the health authorities mentioned earlier to pull the emergency brakes on living with COVID-19 was if they saw more than 75 percent of the nation's ICU beds filled. But even if the country reaches that point, it's very unlikely that the country would revert immediately back to strict level four distancing measures that we saw earlier this year. Health authorities intend to look at all of the factors coming into play and they will take prudent steps to curb the spread. So if they see infection spreading among the unvaccinated, the plan might be to expand vaccine passes. If authorities see outbreaks centered on social gatherings, they might lower the cap on meetings and if they see some facilities or areas to be particularly vulnerable to cluster outbreaks, they're going to strengthen measures specifically in those areas. So this contingency plan that will be announced this week will be with all these specific details. 
Then what are other um, measures that health authorities are taking to bring down the level of um, number of critically ill patients? Well, health authorities are also planning to speed up booster shots. Uh, many of the critical cases are concentrated among the elderly and breakthrough cases among those with waning immunization. So in order to prevent this, Health Minister Kwon Dok Chur mentioned pulling in the period between administering the booster jab and the final round of inoculations. So currently, South Korea recommends people aged 50 and over to get their shots at least six months after being fully vaccinated. And for people in nursing homes or people working at high-risk facilities, they can get their extra jab as early as five months after full inoculation. However, Health Minister Kwon Dok Chur said Monday that health authorities are currently reviewing the best time for people to receive their booster jabs, and this could be three to four months after they get their final doses. All right, Yansun, thank you so much for your report. We will see you again tomorrow with another update. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Seems like uh, COVID-19 is never going to go away <laughs> at this point, unfortunately. Uh, moving on, U.S. President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping are set for their first virtual meeting since Biden entered the White House over 10 months ago. They're expected to cover subjects like that are bones of contention between the two superpowers, namely Taiwan, human rights and trade. They could also discuss North Korean issues. Our Yun Jung Min has this report. Amid geopolitical tensions, U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping are set to have their first ever virtual meeting on Monday evening Washington time and Tuesday morning Beijing time. So far, the two leaders have only talked on the phone twice since Biden took office in January. The agenda of the meeting is likely to include thorny issues on Taiwan, the South China Sea, human rights, trade and technology. China reportedly sees the Taiwan issue as its ultimate red line, while Biden mentioned a few weeks ago that the U.S. is committed to Taiwan's defense. Experts say it will be difficult to narrow their difference through the meeting, but the talks could help to manage these tensions so that these do not bear into full-fledged conflict. At least uh, they can see each other's decided uh, position and also their perception. And also, there is also, we, we should not exclude the possibility to come up with uh, some kind of uh, at least um, a very basic common ground between United States and China, especially in the area of uh, climate change and hopefully the non-proliferation. Trade is also expected to be on the table. Beijing has been asking the Biden administration to lift the tariffs on Chinese goods that were imposed during the Trump administration, but Washington seems happy to leave the tariffs where they are and try to start new trade talks. Watchers say talks are likely to continue between U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai and Chinese Vice Premier Liu He. It also remains to be seen whether the leaders will discuss North Korea and Iran. Experts say if they do discuss the denuclearization of North Korea, they may agree on the importance of diplomacy and dialogue in principle, but in detail, they apparently have different approaches and perspectives on Pyongyang. China has recently uh, argued that the lifting of the sum of the sanction uh, is a very important and first step to resume the dialogue. On the other hand, the, North, the United States definitely disagree with uh, the Chinese uh, approach. It also remains to be seen whether she will invite Biden to the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Some human rights activists have urged governments and athletes to boycott the Beijing Olympics for human rights reasons. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. Officials suggest U.S. President Joe Biden will be very direct on raising concerns about China's behavior when he holds his virtual summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The summit is due to start shortly. A senior U.S. official who asked not to be named told reporters Monday that President Biden will say that as a responsible nation, China should play by the rules of the road. The official added that Biden will make clear the need to build common guardrails to avoid miscalculations. The official also said it's important to keep channels of communication open, but it's not a meeting where Washington expects deliverables.
A senior South Korean diplomat says the government aims to establish a denuclearization process which North Korea cannot easily walk away from. Choi jong gun stressed that this is a framework of the end of war declaration recently proposed by South Korean President Moon Jae-in. Kim hyo san with more. Seoul's first vice foreign minister Choi jong gun has stressed the end of war declaration proposed by the South Korean government seeks to create a denuclearization process from which no one can easily walk away. Addressing the annual South Korea-U.S. Strategic Forum in Washington on Monday, Choi added that this process will likely be a long and even a torturous one. During the forum jointly hosted by the Korea Foundation and the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a Washington-based think tank, Choi also stressed that North Korea must be presented with a clear picture of what it can gain or lose through the process, as the regime could easily be tempted to look back or hesitate to stay the course. He explained the Moon administration has about six months left in power. He also added Seoul is not aiming to achieve everything at once. Rather, he insists that the government is focused on a clear structure and roadmap for the peace process that can be updated to adapt to changing environments and circumstances. Also attending the forum, America's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, Richard Johnson, called for the need to keep sanctions in place while highlighting a diplomatic approach. He also made clear that sanctions are not a form of punishment, rather a tool to minimize threats and to prevent weapons development. Johnson also stressed how the Biden administration has been committed to engaging in diplomatic dialogue with Pyongyang since early this year, following the completion of its North Korea policy review. Kim Yusan, Arirang News. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deep into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. South Korea's first vice foreign minister is currently in Washington for talks on North Korea with his American and Japanese counterparts. He's expected to again press President Moon Jae-in's proposal to formally declare an end to the 1950-1953 Korean War. The administration in Seoul hopes such a move, if realized, might coax the North back to talks on its denuclearization and soothe tensions. Now, this also comes as North Korea is holding a rare event, namely the so-called Fifth Conference of the Frontrunners of the Three Revolutions. For more, we are joined by Professor Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Professor of International Relations at King's College London. Good morning, Professor. Thanks for having me. Now, let's start with the talks in Washington. Many experts say the U.S. isn't interested in a move to formally end the Korean War, with some suggesting it would be too much of a concession and purely symbolic in any case. What is your view on this? Well, I think the, the, there's a difference, of course, between the declaration, uh, end of war declaration, and a formal end to the Korean War. Uh, it seems to me that the U.S. wouldn't be opposed to the declaration uh, at this point or at an earlier stage in a negotiation process uh, with North Korea. But a formal end uh, to the Korean War that would open the way to a peace regime uh, in the Korean Peninsula might be something that Washington is not willing to negotiate or to sign right now. We would need to see a process taking place before uh, this happens. So, uh, so I do think that uh, the U.S. is willing to make a move, but I also do think that this move may not be maybe more symbolic with an end of war declaration uh, rather than something that would put a formal change, legal change to the situation in the Korean Peninsula. And how much of this push uh, do you think is down to President Moon Jae-in wanting to ensure his legacy is that of a peacemaker? And given that his term ends in just a few months, how do you assess his dealings with North Korea over the past five years? Well, President Moon always said that uh, any potential reconciliation or peace process with North Korea uh, would be a long-term process, that he wanted to create the conditions for sustainable uh, peace, for a sustainable peace process. Uh, and I think in this respect, a peace uh, declaration would actually uh, help because whoever is the next uh, Korean president would be able to take this as the starting point for relations uh, between 
the two Koreas and also, of course, between uh, North Korea and the US. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, still a bit soon to know whether uh, President Moon has been successful or not with his move, because a peace declaration would actually be a, a, a symbolic change, uh, and, and therefore you could argue that his policy had been uh, a success. Uh, if the peace declaration doesn't come to happen, I wouldn't call his policy a failure, because he was given a really bad hand, especially with uh, President Trump in the US and his uh, erratic approach uh, towards North Korea. Uh, but uh, you could argue that uh, he did try and he actually showed that dialogue could uh, bring change to the Korean Peninsula, something that wasn't really clear before he came to office. And also, um, do you think North Korea would be happy to sign a formal end of the Korean War? And if it were to happen, do you think the regime would modify its behavior in any way or will we continue to see more of the same? So if, if sanctions relief, uh, a change uh, in its economic relationship with South Korea, with the US, uh, with the rest of the world. So I think that North Korea wouldn't sign a formal uh, end of war um, agreement just for the sake of it. They would want uh, something else in return. We could also talk, for example, about political relations between the US, diplomatic relations between the US and North Korea being established. In terms of changing its behavior, well, history tells us uh, that North Korea goes back to its provocations uh, fairly often when it feels displeased with the behavior of South Korea and, and the US. Uh, so I think that uh, we would see maybe a change in the long term, but in the short term, I wouldn't expect much change from North Korea, especially if at some point it feels that any negotiation process uh, between the two Koreas or with Washington is going nowhere from the perspective of Pyongyang. Yeah, just while you're talking, we're looking at video of President Moon and Kim Jong-un walking along that walkway. It seems like a age ago now, unfortunately. But finally, North Korea says it's holding this uh, conference of front runners of the free revolutions. Uh, it's quite a complicated uh, uh, thing to describe, really. But since this comes at the end of the first year of Kim Jong-un's five-year economic plan, do you think Kim, because he skipped the first one, uh, at least when he was leader in 2015, do you think he's going to show up in person this time? He didn't last time. Um, whether he does or not, what kind of message do you think he's going to send to these lower-level officials? Well, we, we saw that he reappeared finally today after a month uh, with not public uh, appearances. So this may suggest that he's willing to make an appearance in this uh, conference uh, and, and, and in Pyongyang uh, as well, uh, that he's showing his face in public uh, once more. So I think he might be willing to do so uh, this time. Five years ago, he only sent uh, a message uh, to them. To the, to the forum, to the, to the meeting. So this time he might be willing to make an appearance. Uh, if so, I would expect that his message wouldn't be too different from what we have seen over the uh, past year. Uh, essentially that the economic situation is not as good uh, as it could be, and that North Koreans might have to tighten their, their, their belts really, which has been the message that North Korea has been sending uh, basically since, since the pandemic. It uh, started, North Korea closed its borders, and from what we know, the economic situation significantly uh, deteriorated within the country. So what I mean is that I would expect a fairly realistic assessment of where the North Korean economy uh, is today from uh, Kim Jong-un if he either sends a message or actually decides to, to give a speech uh, during the meeting. All right. Now, that was Professor Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Professor of International Relations at King's College London on the latest ongoings with North Korea. Thank you again for your insights, Professor. Thank you. Have a good day. Now, South Korea is ramping efforts up to swiftly import more urea water. This is the solution needed to power diesel vehicles in a bid to ease the shortage crunch. Having diversified its import channels, South Korean officials are looking to bring in supplies from countries like Vietnam, 
The South Korean government is also cracking down on smuggled urea in a bid to better regulate and stabilize the market. Min Suk Hyun with the details. The South Korean government is ramping up efforts to secure several months' supply of urea water solution amid shortage concerns. And in its latest move, the country is working to bring in more supplies of the diesel exhaust fluid as soon as it can. South Korea's industry minister Moon Suk said on Monday that the government is working to swiftly import the already agreed 39,000 tons of urea and 8 milliliters of urea solution from countries mainly Vietnam, Saudi Arabia and Russia. If secured, this would be enough for two months. He also added that imports for some 18,700 tons of urea from China are underway after continued efforts from the public and private sectors. In light of the acute shortages of urea, the government has asked Chinese foreign invested companies for their cooperation in the trade of key raw and subsidiary materials. The country also plans to seek cooperation with two or three more Southeast Asian and Middle Eastern countries to diversify its import channels. Meanwhile, the South Korean Customs Agency said that last week it confiscated four tons of smuggled urea solution. A group of local importers were caught on Friday for attempting to hide and bring in the fluid along with other properly imported goods from China. The Customs Office plans to consult with related agencies to make these supplies available to the local market. It also said that it will strengthen its customs clearance procedures to crack down on such illegal activities. Bin Suk Kyun, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in on Monday attended a christening ceremony for a floating LNG facility set for Mozambique. He said the facility, which is the second uh, biggest of its type in the entire world, will become a symbol of cooperation between the two nations. Kim min -ji with this report. President Moon Jae-in says liquefied natural gas can be a substitute for coal and oil and aid the push to go carbon neutral. Moon spoke on Monday at a christening ceremony for the Coral Soul Floating LNG Facility. The offshore facility, or FLNG, which drills, refines, liquefies, stores and offloads LNG, will head to Mozambique. The Coral Soul FLNG with a length of 432 meters and width of 66 meters is the world's second largest facility and capable of producing 3.4 million tons of LNG each year. Samsung Heavy Industries won the 2.5 billion US dollar deal to build it in 2017. Moon highlighted the competence of South Korea's shipyards, noting that all four of the world's FLNGs were made by the country. He added that Seoul will upgrade its technology for eco-friendly ships, as well as developing zero-carbon smart vessels. Also at the event was Mozambique's president, Philippe Nuzi, on a three-day visit to South Korea. He is the first African head of state to visit the country since the pandemic began. Moon expressed hope that once LNG production begins in Mozambique, this will be a symbol of friendly bilateral ties. 내일 출항할 코랄 술 FLNG는 유지 대통령님의 고향 카부 델가도 앞바다에서 연간 340만 톤의 LNG를 생산 출하게 됩니다. LNG 생산이 본격화 되면 모잠비크 경제는 연 평균 10% 이상 고도 성장할 것으로 전망이 되며 인프라와 제조업의 동반 성장도 기대됩니다. President Yuzi thanks South Korea for sparing no effort, saying that Mozambique will continue to become his destination for such investment. He called for continued interest in Mozambique's development, adding that his country will also contribute to peace on the Korean Peninsula and the world. Kim min Arirang News. Over the course of the next 10 years, South Korea aims to build more than 100 satellites and put them into orbit using 100% domestically developed technology. The announcement Monday said it will boost the country's space program. BNG reports. By 2031, South Korea plans to develop around 170 satellites and launch around 40 rockets using homegrown launchers. 
The country's Prime Minister Kim bu gyeon made the announcement at the National Space Council on Monday, held to boost space development. He said that the government's efforts will provide an environment for Korean companies to easily get involved in the space race. And added that by 2035, Korea will have its own navigation satellite system, or Korea Positioning System. To develop and create the system over the next 14 years, the Korean government plans to invest 3.72 trillion won, or 3.3 billion U.S. dollars. This is the largest budget the country has ever pledged for space development. The prime minister emphasized that through the system, the country will have a stable infrastructure, and that the government will also actively invest in developing self-driving cars, urban air mobility, and other industries related to the fourth industrial revolution. Monday's Space Council meeting follows the recent launch of South Korea's first homegrown rocket, Duri. Although the test fell short of the original goal of putting a dummy satellite into orbit, Duri did complete its full flight sequence and stepped up the country's ambitions in space travel. Peunji, Arirang News. Experts from the IAEA arrived in Japan Monday to assess Tokyo's preparations for the release into the ocean of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear plant. The six experts are scheduled to meet with Japanese officials and visit the plant. They'll also discuss the technical details of the planned release. The review comes as Japan requested assistance from the IAEA to ensure the discharge means international safety standards and to calm the concerns of the international community. Japan's plan has faced fierce opposition from not only local residents, but also neighboring countries like South Korea and China. And now we cross over to our Oseung for global insights and an in it look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks very much, Wogyun. It is indeed time for Global Insights, where we connect with experts from around the world on issues making headlines. As price levels continue to surge around the world, central banks are tightening their monetary policies to suppress further inflation. And this has actually made cryptocurrency all the more attractive as a hedge option for investors everywhere, including here in South Korea, where daily crypto transactions have actually surpassed that of the main board's Kospi. We discuss this trend today with James Royal, writer and stock analyst based in Washington, D.C., and as with Damodaran, professor at Stern Business School at New York University. A very warm welcome to you both. It's a very exciting uh, issue to discuss today. And well, we have quite a lot of questions to cover. So let's start with you, uh, Dr. Royal, joining us in Washington. Now, here in South Korea, the number of crypto exchange users have soared to more than 7.23 million as of July from around 1.5 million at the end of 2020. So and around a uh, 6 million jump just in a matter of six months. And well, daily transactions have actually um, beaten those of the main bourse, Kospi. So you can see that the, there's growing preference for cryptocurrencies, and this actually seems to be happening globally. So my question to you is, why are more and more investors turning to crypto assets rather than the stock market? Uh, well, certainly part of this is that there's a lottery ticket-like atmosphere. The more these go up in value, the more people are attracted to them. And at times we've seen uh, really high returns in these types of assets, uh, sometimes thousands of percent just over a, a period of a few weeks or a few months. And so, uh, or in the case of uh, Squidcoin, for example, 230,000 percent in just a couple weeks. And so that also leads to fear of missing out. So people pile in. Uh, because they see a neighbor making 100%, 200%, 300% in just a short period of time. Uh, but I think also part of that is a misunderstanding of what you're actually investing in when you're investing in one of these currencies. Uh, they are not backed by any fundamental hard asset or cash flow, unlike a traditional stock, for example. So you've got no claim on that. So uh, that helps contribute to the lottery ticket-like atmosphere. And then Finally, these, a lot of these products are deflationary by design. So they're designed to go up because there's limited supply. And so as traders pile in uh, against a fixed supply, that helps push up the price. So they're really structured in a way to go up. And this helps uh, give them a lottery ticket-like atmosphere, but also a confidence game type atmosphere. 
Well, there certainly has been a lottery ticket like atmosphere uh, throughout the pandemic, especially. And well, Professor uh, Damodaran, now high levels of inflation aren't usually great for stocks. And indeed, here in South Korea, the main boss, Kospi, has been on a downward trend recently. But then in the United States, where you are, the um, S&P 500 did quite well last month. So what explains these quite different market reactions? A month to month, who knows what drives stocks? I mean, it could be fundamentals, it could be mood, it could be momentum. All of this year, we've had two forces fighting it out in the U.S. One is the expectation of growth, which is we're coming back from COVID, there's going to be economic growth. On the other, you've got this worry about inflation. And I think over the year, growth has beaten out inflation, but the battle's not over. I think this is something we're going to see fought out over the rest of this year and through next year. So I think it's too early to pass judgment on where U.S. stocks have come down on this, because I think the fight is still on. I see. And well, Dr. Royal, it seems that, um, you know, that doesn't seem to be an end to this inflationary pressure and nobody really knows when it's going to end. So with um, in, you know, price levels surging, um, inflation seeming to be uncon uncontrollable at the moment, do you see crypto transactions and valuations continuing to surge? I think we'll continue to see it, but perhaps for reasons that are uh, outside of the inflationary environment, right? Um, we'll continue to see total market capitalizations continue to rise, um, despite perhaps some setbacks where you have China, for example, that's outlawed cryptocurrency. And that might have put a temporary speed bump on the road, but I think we're going to continue to see this. Um, as long as demand keeps hitting that fixed supply, we're likely to see uh, prices of Bitcoin or Ethereum continue to rise. Um, and uh, so uh, until we see a real kind of event that uh, an existential crisis, so to speak, that forces the market uh, or crypto traders to reassess uh, cryptocurrency, uh, I think we'll continue to see uh, prices rise and total market capitalization rise. It's already now at $3 trillion. And well, uh, before we move on, uh, Professor Damodaran, just another quick question here about inflation. Well, um, Fed has been insisting that the factors behind um, the upward price pressure are transitionary. What are your thoughts on this? Come on, let's get out of denial here. I mean, I think we started the year with the excuse that it was coming out of COVID. Now it's supply chains. I mean, the Fed, like everybody else, is composed of human beings capable of seeing whatever they want to see. I think in some point in time, you've got to face up to the facts that inflation is here. Now, we can debate whether that inflation is going to be 3%, 4%, or 5%. But to sit behind a, a desk and say, you know what, inflation is not there, is just being in denial. And well, while inflation continues, Dr. Royal, which sectors do you think are going to do quite well? Uh, well, I think about it in terms of investments and energies and commodities typically do well uh, traditionally in response to inflationary pressures. Uh, real estate is often a, spe uh, a good investment and perhaps particularly attractive now given low, historically low uh, interest rates. So you can lock in uh, financing for a real estate purchase potentially for decades uh, and either own that asset or rent that asset. Uh, but one of the things I try to focus on is instead of sectors, individual companies. And you're really looking for companies here that can pass on price increases uh, and ideally not have to absorb price increases themselves. And so in that type of environment, they can take advantage uh, of not having to reinvest in their own fixed assets, reinvest in their own inventory at increasingly higher prices, and yet they can also pass on price increases to others. So I think, for example, uh, businesses like royalties businesses, such as a McDonald's or a Yum Brands, that their franchisees have to invest in the fixed fixed expenses. But those business, the royalties businesses just take a cut off of sales off the top and uh, can pass on price increases. So in general, I look for businesses that can pass on price increases over time. And generally, those will do well over time. And well, speaking of individual businesses, Professor Damodaran, I know that you've been um, speculating on Tesla and while well, they seem to be coming up with some in, um, exciting news and develops all, developments all the time, um, what would be your current uh, prediction or your uh, thoughts on Tesla's latest market moves? 
I, th I think you mean speculating with words, not speculating with money, because uh, that's not my game. I mean, I, I've, I value Tesla for the first time in 2013. I value them every year since. I mean, let's give the company credit. It's been one of the most amazing stories of US of equity markets of this century. So I've, I've told people I've been quite open about the fact that I've been wrong at every step of this process. I bought Tesla in June of 2019, but I've been out of the market. That said, though, this is a stock that attracts very, very divided attention. On the one side, your people are convinced still it's a scam, that Elon Musk is the biggest con man in the face of the earth and the stock is worth nothing. On the other hand, you've got true believers who think Tesla is going to be not just a great stock, but the greatest stock of all time. It's difficult to talk about Tesla without getting attacked by both sides. I do think that Tesla was tailor-made to take advantage of COVID because COVID created winners out of young companies, growth companies, risky companies, flexible companies. And if you had central casting, create a company to take advantage of what happened during COVID, Tesla would be it. So one thing we can't argue with is the fact that Tesla coming, comes out of this crisis a lot stronger than it did going in. The question is whether how strong it is. And that's what we're debating in the market right now, because I think markets have gotten a little ahead of themselves in where they think Tesla can end up. Well, whether it's very uh, high growth companies or uh, cryptocurrency, there's been a lot of speculation. There's a lot of, um, as you said, there's a divide between people who are very excited or perhaps getting ahead of themselves and people who are quite pessimistic about the whole frenzy. But well, as for cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and um, Ethereum, they hit record highs after news of uh, higher than expected consumer price inflation in October. Um, do you think that uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum can now be regarded as safe gold-like assets, or do you think they're in danger of being grossly overvalued? That's is, to is that question to me? Okay. First, I think two things. One is you can't invest in cryptocurrencies. You can only really trade cryptocurrencies. To invest in something, you need something at the base of. So let's start off by taking the word investing out of cryptocurrency. You can trade cryptocurrencies. And I'm not sure that right now they're being traded as cryptocurrencies, they're being traded as crypto collectibles. And the reason I draw the distinction is the essence of a currency, you use it for transactions. And all this talk about Bitcoin is about trading Bitcoin. It's not about transacting with Bitcoin. So right now, the argument for Bitcoin might, it seems to be that it's millennial gold, that if you're 35 years old and you're freaking out about where the world is going, Rather than putting your money in gold, you're going to put in Bitcoin. Well, gold has had staying power for 4,000 years. Bitcoin's been around 13 years. Let's see whether Bitcoin can actually hang in there. Because this is the first true test of Bitcoin being a collectible. It succeeded for a month and a half or two months. Let's see if it makes it through the next couple of years. Because that really is something that we still don't know. And Dr. Royal, while the House of Representatives in the US, they passed a uh, 1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, which includes a tax reporting requirement that could affect a large number of crypto companies. And there's also talk of introducing taxes on unrealized gains on crypto assets. So with regulation and taxation on the way, do you think this is bad news or an opportunity for crypto firms? Well, I think ultimately regulation uh, provides legitimacy to something like a cryptocurrency, where there is a lot of uncertainty about evaluation. And I, I'll tr let's turn particular to stable coins, right, which are pegged or try to peg themselves uh, to a fixed currency, uh, to a to a real life currency such as uh, the U.S. dollar, right? And they say stable coins purport to have. Uh, their assets backed, uh, the, the coin backed by real assets such as cash. Um, in, in fact, uh, major stable coins are backed by a little bit of cash and a lot of debt. And that's not the same thing as cash, So, especially in a crisis. And so uh, ultimately regulation, if it can iron out some of those inconsistencies and provide a, a stable framework and a legitimizing framework for some, for some things like that, that's valuable. Uh, and then the tax situation, just broadly, you, you've already got a tax situation in the U.S. that uh, seriously discourages the use of cryptocurrency as currency, right? So if you use cryptocurrency to buy and sell uh, goods and services, if the value you receive is more than what you've paid 
that's a tax liability that you've incurred. And while you might not get a tax reporting form for that, you still technically owe taxes uh, on that realized gain. So that's important to understand here in the tax situation. What the pending legislation now is very broadly written, and it probably ends up being scaled back uh, to some extent. And well, Dr. Royal, uh, cryptocurrencies, they are getting more and more diverse by the day, and some seem to generate massive speculation despite a lack of um, real world utility. What kind of cryptocurrency should new investors avoid? Uh, well, I, I don't see cryptocurrency really as being investable at all. Um, I, I think it's, as uh, Professor Demodoran said, I think it's a trading vehicle, uh, at least at least right now. Um, and so that's why you, you get uh, somebody, uh, a legendary investor such as Warren Buffett saying, I think this is probably rat poison squared. Unlike a stock, right, that's backed by the assets and cash flow of an underlying business, most cryptocurrencies are not backed by anything at all. So you're trading against other people and you have to basically think that somebody else is going to become more optimistic than you are about the future of these cryptocurrencies. And so if you insist on taking that risk, I think what you need to look for is a cryptocurrency that has a strong ecosystem behind it, uh, that has a lot of functionality. But again, these are really trading assets and there are a lot of people who do not believe in the long-term success here. They're really just trying to trade back and forth. And a lot of smaller investors are gonna get caught up in that uh, furor and probably lose a lot of money. And before you go, uh, Professor Damodar, and your thoughts on this as well, do you think they can be, cryptocurrency can be controlled or do you think it's better to leave it to the invisible hand? Now think about it. Collective value of all cryptos put together is $3 billion. The market cap of Microsoft alone is two and a half trillion dollars. Think of how much time and energy we've wasted over the last 10 years talking about something that in the larger scheme of things is a side story. I think the fact is with the amount of attention crypto's got has been vastly out of proportion to its significance in the investment universe. If you're an investor, if you want to use crypto to get rich quickly, go ahead, but don't fool yourself into believing that somehow this is now going to become the center of your investment portfolio. There isn't enough value here to make that happen. So I think we need to be real about what cryptocurrencies can and cannot do. And also draw a distinction about why we think we're holding cryptocurrencies. Is, is it because they're a hedge against inflation and crises? Or is it because we think we'll eventually be using these to actually do transactions? I'm not getting that clarity even from people who are advocates for cryptocurrencies. Well, it looks like investors might not want to turn away from stocks just yet. Well, this is all we have time for today. That was James Royal, writer and stock analyst based in Washington, D.C. And as with Thermodaran, professor at Stern Business School at New York University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. BTS has won four awards at this year's MTV Europe Music Awards, snagging the most trophies at the ceremony, which returned to its in-person format in Budapest on Sunday local time. BTS took home Best Pop, Best Group, as well as Best K-Pop and Biggest Fans. This is the group's second time winning four awards. Last year, they won Best Song, Best Virtual Live, Best Group and Biggest Fans. Ed Sheeran won Best Artist and Best Song for Bad Habits. The Best Music Video went to Montero by Little Nas X. Turning to baseball news now, it was Game 2 of the KBO Korean Series on Monday evening with South Korea gradually returning to a degree of, of uh, what it was like pre-pandemic. The atmosphere in the stadium was rocking compared to what it has been. Our Han Song Yu went to see Katie Wiz take on the Doosan Bears and files this report. With game two also in the bag, 
the KT Wiz is inching closer and closer to securing its first ever Korean series title. After just seven years in the top flight of domestic baseball as the KBO League's 10th and newest ball club. The regular season champions defeated the Tucson Bears 6-1 at the Kochuk Sky Dome in Seoul on Monday on six scoreless innings pitched by starting pitcher So Hyung Jun. Over 10,000 fans packed the stands to experience baseball's gradual return to normal. Starting November 1st, the KBO has been allowing 100% capacity fan attendance at ball games for the first time in over two years. But all spectators above the age of 18 must either be fully vaccinated or show proof of a negative PCR test taken within 48 hours. Medical exceptions are accepted as well. Mask wearing is mandatory, obviously, and cheering and chanting are banned. The Sky Dome's an indoor ballpark, so unlike outdoor ones, eating is not allowed. These measures didn't discourage fans from enjoying game two, though. We've been playing well lately. KT's going to win. Tucson always performs better in the fall. We thrive during the postseason. I trust that this time will be no different. Despite losing the first two games, it's too early to count the Bears out. They're the one and only team to have made it to the Korean series seven years in a row. And they've won three of those championships since 2015. Han Sung, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. The UK raised its national threat level to severe on Monday after declaring a taxi explosion outside a hospital in Liverpool on Sunday, a terrorist incident. A severe threat level means another attack is seen as highly likely, keeping officials on high alert throughout the day. The explosion occurred around 11 a.m. as a Remembrance Day service to commemorate the war dead was being held at nearby Liverpool Cathedral. The taxi was blown up by an explosive device that was in the possession of a passenger who was killed by the explosion. Three men, all in their 20s, were arrested on Sunday, while a fourth was arrested Monday. The taxi driver who survived the blast was praised for his heroics. So first of all, this is an ongoing investigation, and uh, so I, I can't co comment on the, on the details or, or exactly what type of uh, incident it, it was, what type of crime it may have been, uh, but it does look as though uh, the taxi driver in question did behave uh, with incredible presence of mind and, and, and bravery. Police say they believe they know the identity of the passenger who carried the explosive, but could not disclose it. Video footage released by Polish authorities on Monday shows a massive group of migrants gathering in large groups on the Belarusian side of the fence at the main Kuznica border crossing with Polish military seen defending the border. Migrants were also met with rows of razor wire fencing as Poland ramps up measures at its border to prevent any migrants from coming into the country. The EU has accused Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko of orchestrating the influx of migrants to EU member countries like Poland, Lithuania and Latvia to pressure the bloc to back down over sanctions slapped on his government. Polish border guards have reported over 5,000 irregular crossings from Belarus so far in November, compared to just 120 in all of 2020. French President Emmanuel Macron has switched to using a darker navy blue on the official French flag, replacing the previous brighter shade in an apparent nod to the French Revolution. The change of color on the flags adorning the Elysee Palace was first made a year ago, but went mostly unnoticed until recently. Both the darker and lighter blues have been used for decades, as the French Navy and many of the country's official buildings have used the darker hue. The lighter hue was introduced in 1976 under President Destang, as the country wanted to match the blue on the flag of Europe. The French presidential office made it clear that the latest change should not be interpreted as an anti-EU gesture. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News.
Good morning. It's a chillier morning than Monday, and highs will also be a couple of degrees lower this afternoon here in the capital, just going up to 13 degrees Celsius. Elsewhere, we'll also notice big gaps in readings between lows and highs today. Single-digit morning temperatures to begin the day in most parts, just 4 degrees Celsius in Seoul, Daejeon, Daegu, and over in Gyeongju. Chuncheon, though, is just above the freezing mark this morning. Sunny skies will dominate across Korea today for most of the day, but Gwangju, Jeollabukdo, and Daegu could have high dust levels during the first half of the day, but things should improve as the day goes on. In highs will be topping out in the upper regions, will be a couple of degrees lower today, but elsewhere will have a similar afternoon temperatures, going up to 17 degrees in Daegu, Gwangju, and Gyeongju this afternoon. There could be slight rain in west of central regions on Thursday, which is the day of the student or college entrance exam. Meanwhile, the afternoon warms stays through this week. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back at the same time on Wednesday, 8 a.m. Korea time at New Day at Arirang. I'm Kim Mogan. And I'm Mark Broom. I'll be back in just around an hour for our next newscast. But in the meantime, stay tuned to Arirang TV, and we'll both see you at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.